a decision that we should not be destroyed. As you said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 26 to 28, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay every man for what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Lord, let your kingdom come. Your kingdom experience, O God, of power and liberation for those who seek you be received in this time. Even as the world began, the stars they sang, and all the angels shouted for joy, shouted for joy. Looking back through history, the people they have always had a song they must sing, a song they must sing. We are the people of God. We sing a song here on the earth. Your song will resound all over the world. Your praises ring out. We're living to sing your name of renown all over the world. Young and old, near and far, there's a place for every heart to join in your song. Join in your song. Every nation, tribe, and tongue come together, join us one, give glory to God, glory to God. We are the people of God. We sing your song here on the earth. All over the world, your song will resound. All over the world, your praises ring out. We're living to see your name and renown all over the world. All over the world, your song will resound. All over the world, your praises ring out. We're living to see your name and renown all over the world. Your name, Lord. Great is your name, and great will be your song. We give you praise. Great is your name, and great will be your song. We lift up our hands and pray. We lift up our hands and pray. For holy is your name. We lift up our hands and pray. We lift up our hands and pray. Holy is your name. All over the world, your song will resound. All over the world, your praises ring out. We're living to see your name and renown. All over the world. All over the world, your song will resound. All over the world, your praises.
waters ring out. We're living to see your name and renown all over the world. Even as the world began, the stars they sang, and all the angels shouted for joy. Amen. Shouted for joy. Looking back. Looking back through history, the people knew have always had a song they were singing, a song they were singing. We are the people of God. We sing your song here on the earth. All over the world, your song will resound. All over the world, your praises ring out. We're living to say your name and renown all over the world. All over the world, your song will resound. All over the world, your praises ring out. We're living to say your name and renown all over the world. Praise you. Thank, you. Thank you, Jesus, for the power of your glory, O oh God, that reigns over our lives. And we look at you, O oh God, Jesus, as the light chosen, O oh God, that we may not stumble, that we may walk in your ways and rejoice in your word and praise your name all eternally. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We just want to lift your presence, O oh God, today. Lord, in all that you have built, in all that you have promised, Lord, great is your name. Thank you, Jesus. Great is your name and great will be your song. Amen, Lord. Great is your name and great will be your song. Great is your name. Great is your name and great will be your song. Great is your name and great will be your song. Thank you, Jesus. Great is your name, and awesome is your glory, O oh God. Let the power of praise rise. Jesus, you have told us that you came to the earth for this one thing, to cast fire upon the earth. And the fire you were talking of, Jesus, is the fire that you wanted to cast on my poor soul, on our miserable souls, Lord, cast that fire. But often when you look, when you look into our soul, you find a soul that is cold, reluctant to acknowledge you, slothful to be in union with you. Oh Lord, today, cast that fire. We need that fire. We're desperate for that fire that you said you came to the earth to cast fire upon it. Lord, let your holy fire the fire of divine love be cast upon our souls. We are hungry, Lord, that we can give our all to you with all that we have. We come to you and give all that we have. All that I am is for you, Lord.
Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live, the reason that I sing with all I to worship, Lord, your name. Walk with you wherever you will go through tears and joy I'll trust in you and I will live in all of your ways your promises forever Jesus I believe in you Jesus I belong to you you're the reason that I live the reason that I sing Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. The reason that I live, the reason that I sing with all I worship you and we give you the power of God of praise and honor to you alone
Lord Jesus, as we contemplate the last moment of your earthly human life, the last words you uttered on the cross, teach us to live and to die for you and for you alone. Give us the grace to trust in you that he will take us to the Heavenly Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. And our eternity is assured in your mercy. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me read for you from the Gospel. According to Luke chapter 23, verses 44 to 46, it was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon because of an eclipse of the sun. Then the veil of the temple was torn down the middle. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, in your hands I command my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The Gospel of the Lord. My dear sisters and brothers, as we stand in reverence at the last moment of the earthly life of Jesus, as we hear the last words of Jesus before breathing his last on this earth. Let us learn to live and die as Jesus lived and died. Our earthly life is to be patterned on the life of Jesus, the Son of God, that we may live with him forever in all eternity. At that last moment, the gospel tells us the sun eclipsed. There was darkness all over the land for three hours from noon to three in the afternoon. The sun did not want anyone to see the cruelty man has done to the creator. The sun eclipsed. There was a violent earthquake, lightning and thunder. The nature was rebelling, protesting against this terrible cruelty and sin of the humankind. Wherever man and woman rebel against God, nature will rebel against man and woman, against the humankind. It's exactly what is happening around us today. The selfishness of man, exploiting everything around him for his selfish pleasure, for his own petty plans. The selfishness has destroyed the nature. And the nature is rebelling now against humankind. In fact, the last moment of our life on earth 
is decisive. It determines our eternity. How we are going to be in all eternity. The good thief at the last moment of his life turned to God. Remember me when you are in your kingdom. And that prayer brought him to paradise with the Lord. The last moment of our life also reveals the whole life of a person. Summing up how the person lived. Revealing the basic spiritual attitude of a person. Jesus breathes his last offering his life in the hands of the Father. Jesus cried in loud voice, Father, into your hands I command my spirit. The life of Jesus was always committed, totally committed to the Father. In fact, this word that Jesus uttered into your hands, I command my spirit, is what every Jewish mother will pray with the little child before the child sleeps. Into your hands, I command my spirit. Before the threatening darkness, the child will Open the eyes. Look into the eyes of the mother. And the mother will pray with the child. Into your hands I command my spirit. I'm going to close my eyes. I do not know when and whether I will open my eyes again. My life, my night, my darkness I offer to you. Every child, Jewish child, fell asleep saying these words. But Jesus, when he said it, at the last moment of his earthly human life, he added one word, Abba, Father, into your hands, I command my spirit. Confidence, like a child offering its life in the hands of the dad. Jesus offered his life in the hands of God. With great trust, total confidence in the loving care of the Heavenly Father. In fact, that sums up the whole life of Jesus on earth. He entered the world by saying, Behold, I come to do your will as it is written in the scroll. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. As it is written in the scroll, Behold, I come to do your will. The only purpose of my coming to the earth, Abba, is to do your will. And the first sound the Son of God heard as he entered into the womb of his immaculate mother, Mother Mary, the heart beat of Mother Mary, the heart of Mother Mary beating that voice of surrender. Here I am. Your servant. Let it be done to me. According to your word. The months he was. In the womb of his mother. He heard that beating in surrender. The beating 
of the heart of his mother. The first recorded words of Jesus are Luke chapter 2 verse 49. Why did you search for me? Didn't you know I must be in my father's house? Joseph and Mary searching for Jesus lost in the temple. And the child Jesus telling them, didn't you know I must be in my father's business? Jesus was always in the business of the father. He knew he came with a mission. And all that Jesus did, all that Jesus said was in fulfillment of that mission. My food, Jesus said, John chapter 4, verse 34, my food, my nourishment is to do the will of my father. All that I say is what my father has asked me to say. All that I do is what my father has asked me to do. I'm here to complete the work of my father, the work of salvation. And the whole life of Jesus totally surrendered to the Heavenly Father is now culminated in that prayer. Abba, into your hands I command my spirit. At that moment, something beautiful, significant happened. The temple veil was torn open. There was a large veil in the temple. The veil that separated the people from God. There was the big hall of the temple where the people prayed. And then the Holy of Holies. It was in the Holy of Holies that God dwelt. No one entered the Holy of Holies, only the high priest, that too, only once a year on the Feast of Atonement to offer sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Holy of Holies, where God dwelt. The Holy of Holies, the presence of God was separated from man by this veil. When the life of Jesus the life of total surrender to the Father culminated in that prayer. That veil was torn open. The Holy of Holies was thrown open. God's presence, hitherto barred from man, is now thrown open for man. The heart of God, hitherto hidden, was bared open. We are told that the heart of Jesus was pierced open immediately after that. That heart remains open for you and for me. And we know what is there in the heart of God. We are a people privileged to know what is there in the heart of God. Love. Because John testifies, I saw that. The heart of Jesus was pierced open and blood and water came out. And this is to fulfill the prophecy. We will look at him. Him we have pierced. We have pierced him. And we pierce him all the time with our sin. Even when we pierce him, his heart remains open for us. God is not anymore hidden from man, concealed from man. Jesus said, John 14, 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. The mystery of incarnation is now completed at incarnation, when the Son of God came down to the earth, the angel revealed that mystery to Joseph. God becoming man, 
God with man, Emmanuel, the name of God will be Emmanuel. Name signifies the nature of God. The nature of God is Emmanuel, God with us, no more. Separate from man. God with man. And man is elevated and privileged and sanctified to be with God. God in every wound of man. Every wound of man becoming a sacred wound, bringing salvation. God in every temptation of man, strengthening him and her to say no to devil, the devil whom Jesus defeated. God in the midst of our struggles and troubles and trials. The psalm fulfilled. God with us in the dark valley of tears. Man is not alone anymore. God is there for man, with man. And God is always with us. What the book of Revelation tells us, chapter 21. Behold, the dwelling of God is with man. God wiping away every tear. God, the light, becoming light of man. The temple of God, the dwelling place of God is with man. A great moment in the history of salvation, the culmination of the salvation of man. And therefore, we have confidence. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6, the Lord revealing to us the great plan and mystery. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Have faith in God. Have faith in me. These are not empty promises. Do not let your hearts be troubled at no moment. At no moment of challenge. At no moment of temptation. At no moment of struggle. Shall your heart be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. There is no reason I should not believe in the Lord. What St. Paul tells us, Romans 8.32, If God did not spare His own Son when it came to our salvation, will He deny anything to us? Will He deny anything to us? His presence and loving care and mercy will never be denied to me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If there were not, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself so that where I am, you also may be. The Lord has prepared a place for us. A place for us. To be in all eternity with Him. We will be with him, as St. Paul tells us, of our eternity being with the Lord. That's what he came for, to take us to himself, to prepare a place for us in heaven. Death gets a new meaning here. That is not a tragedy anymore. No. That is a moment. My Lord comes to me with his angels and takes me to himself. A moment of the visitation of the Lord who loved me, lived for me, and died for me to forgive my sins. May God coming to take me to himself so that I may be with him forever. And therefore, with St. Paul, we will be able to say, Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What 
then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but handed him over for us all, how will he not also give us everything along with him? Who will bring a charge against God's chosen ones? It is God who acquits us. Who will condemn us? It is Christ Jesus who died, rather was raised up, who also is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. What will separate us from the love of God? Will anguish or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? Nothing can separate us now. My dear brothers and sisters, a confidence the death of Jesus gives us to surrender our life totally in the hands of God. To trust in Him. Trust in Him at every moment. As Psalm 31, it is verse 6 that Jesus uttered on the cross. Psalm 31, a psalm of trust. The trust of the psalmist, King David. At the face of all the dangers. And David did go through a lot of challenges and dangers. But the trust of the psalmist in God. In you, Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to rescue me. Be my rock of refuge, a stronghold to save me. You are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead and guide me. Free me from the net that I have set for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hands I command my spirit. You will redeem me, Lord, faithful God. The last prayer of Jesus gives us this confidence. Whoever may have cast a net, whoever may have placed a trap, we will never be scared because God is there for me. God is there for me at every moment. He's my refuge. Many words the psalmist is saying, our refuge, our rock, our fortress. That's what God is. At this moment, as we contemplate this last moment of the earthly human life of Jesus, for our life on earth, there is a great lesson. A lesson of trusting in God. Handing over our life to God into your hands, Father, into your hands. And one moment, the Lord cried out, Why have you forsaken me? But now, the Father, so close, so near, so dear, handing over, I give my life in your hands. God is so close to us. Our God is so near to us. The veil is torn apart. Nothing separating me from my God. And nothing on this earth will ever separate me from my God. My God is there for me. And I want to live for my God at every moment. And I am sure I will be with him forever in all eternity. A God Thank you for this confidence of faith and love that you are giving us today. Your death was not the tragic end. It was the passage for you to the glory of the resurrection. And your death makes our death also a passage, an avenue 
cross over to eternal glory. God, we trust in you. We want to live for you. Always, at every moment. Amen.
dear friends the more i try to fill myself with the world the more empty i became it took me a long time to know jesus although i would tell him every night jesus i love you jesus i love you 10 times before i would sleep there was a strange love and a desire for jesus but i never knew it i never knew how far away i was how faint the voice of the lord was until one night as i was singing with a group 1380 and we would entertain people and we would be singing heavy metal rock songs and i remember one night as i was singing and there was so much going on around us and there was this deep thirst to be free and i cried out with all my heart i said jesus take me away from here i don't want to be here your lord i want to be with you i cried out to the lord from the depths of my heart and few weeks later i was led for a retreat here at the divine retreat center i came with my long hair and my beard and i came with a lot of thirst in my heart for i knew there was a strange excitement i was going to meet jesus and in this retreat jesus never disappointed me on thursday night before the infilling of the holy spirit on friday i once again cried out to jesus and i said lord i want to see you i want the gifts of the holy spirit lord i want to know you lord and that night i slept a peaceful sleep but when i woke up in the morning my body was on fire i was burning with high temperature i couldn't even move from my bed i thought that was the end of the retreat for me the volunteers helped me to the hall and i remember at that time I was just listening to what they were telling me. They said, close your eyes and pray for the person in front of you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I could see fathers coming around, laying their hands and praying for those we were praying for. When the priest came to me, Father Panakal, the director of the Malayalam Retreat Center at this moment, a saintly man, I never opened my eyes but I could sense him. He came and he stood before me praying for this person I was praying for. And he moved to the next person and suddenly I saw Jesus. I saw bits and pieces of the crucifixion. I saw his face. He was in great pain. He couldn't get up. And I I got a terrible thirst, a thirst which even water will not satisfy i could see strange people around me and i heard this voice telling me do not ask them for water you will not get it what jesus was telling me is what you need is the living waters and you will never be thirsty again as he said to the samaritan woman and i remember at that time my whole body was swaying I couldn't even stand and a cool breeze was blowing from the front filling me with love with joy and with peace when I opened my eyes I saw I was so healthy my fever had gone and I was filled with so much of peace so much of joy and so much of love filled my heart and I could experience the lord my whole life changed I went back a different person that was more than 30 years ago my dear friends praise the lord 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Lord is faithful to whatever He has promised. All we need to do is just reach out to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to see you. I want to know you. I want to, Lord, walk in the path that you have chosen for me. I want to know your plans, O oh God, for me. That's all I need, Lord. That's all I want, O oh God. Tell him. He will never disappoint you. He will show you his love. And it's his love will make you cry. For we have sinned and brought him to suffer to the point of even death on a cross. In the way that he was treated as an animal. And we could see his love in his eyes looking at us. It is for us that he came to suffer. God's love is so awesome, my dear friends. It holds us, it sustains us, it leads us into a future we have no idea that God came to reveal to us about. And today, as we return to him, we experience it. All that God wants from us is to cry out from our heart and tell him, Lord, show me your love. Help me to see you, Lord. Help me to know, O oh God, who you are. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. My dear brothers and sisters, the Word of God tells us in the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. My dear brothers and sisters, as we are in the presence of our God, let us all ask Jesus, to take us deeper into the love, into a love affair with Him. And as we sing this song, let us all mean each word that we sing, and let us all give honor and glory to our God. I just want to love you more and more 
how I long to be deeper with you. We sing together. Take me deeper, deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deep, take me deeper. Hold me close in your embrace Take me deeper Deeper than I ever been before I just want to love you more and more How I know to be deeper in love How I know to be deeper in love My dear brothers and sisters, the Word of God tells us in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And as the Word of God tells us in the first letter, of St. John chapter 4 verse 8 it says anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love and as we are in the presence of such an awesome loving God let us all give our whole self to Jesus to fill us with his love to fill us with his peace with his joy with his strength and as we sing this song once again, let us all give our whole self to Jesus, asking Him to fill our lives, to fill our families, to fill our place with the love of God. We sing together. There is a longing only you can fill, a raging tempest only you can still my soul is thirsty lord to know you as i know drink from the river that flows before your throne take me deeper deeper in love with you jesus hold me in your embrace take me deeper deeper than I ever been before I just want to love you more and more how I long to be deeper in love let me see once again take me deeper deeper in love with you Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper, take me deeper, deeper than I ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I long to be deeper in love. How I long to be deeper in love. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. My dear brothers and sisters, the Word of God tells us in the book of Psalm, chapter 16, verse 2, it says, I said to the Lord, You are my Lord, and I have no good besides you.
मेरे ब्रदर्स एंड सिस्टर्स एज वी आर इन द प्रेजेंस ऑफ आर गॉड लेट अस ऑल रिमेंबर द वर्ड ऑफ गॉड इन द बुक ऑफ साम चैप्टर 18 वर्स 2 इट सेस द लॉर्ड इज माय रॉक एंड माय फोर्ट्रेस एंड माय डिलीवरर माय गॉड माय रॉक इन हुम आई टेक रेफ्यूज माय शील्ड and the horn of my salvation my stronghold as we are looking to jesus let us all sing together lord you are my all in all lord you are my strength you are my treasure you are everything i need and everything i want lord And as we sing this song lord we offer ourselves all that we are and all that we have once again and we ask you to fill our hearts to fill our lives with your love and we sing together you are my strength when i am weak you are the treasure that i see You are my all in all Seeking you as a precious jewel Lord to give up I'd be a fool You are my all in all Let me sing once again You are my strength when I am weak You are the treasure that I see You are my all in all Seeking you Jesus Seeking you as a precious jewel Lord to give up I'd be a fool You are my all in all Listen Jesus Lamb of God Worthy tells us in the second book of Samuel chapter 22 verse 3 it says my god my rock in whom i take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation my stronghold and my refuge my savior you save me from violence my dear brothers and sisters as we sing the song once again i want all of you to look at jesus and say to him lord you are my all in all you are my strength when i am weak you are the treasure that i seek lord you are my all in all we sing together you are my strength when i am weak you are the treasure that i seek you are my all in all i want all of you to sing with me seeking you as a precious jewel Lord to give up I'd be a fool you are my all in all and we sing together taking my sin taking my sin my cross my shame rising again I'll bless your name you are my all in all when I fall down you pick me up When I am dry you fill my cup you are my all in all and we sing together Jesus Jesus 
intercession of our blessed mother to be with us this time to help us we pray hail mary full of grace the lord is with you blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb jesus holy mary mother of god pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death amen Praise the Lord. Praise Lovely to be back with you. I've been missing you. I, I hope you've been opening yourself up to the Lord. I was talking to a lady before. Her hair is red. I said, did somebody pray over you for the fire of the Holy Spirit to come upon you? <laughs> you know, a few years ago, somebody asked me to pray over them. So we gathered around and we put our, I put my hands on her head and we had our eyes closed and during the prayer her head moved but her hair did not. <laughs> I thought only one of two things happened. Either I prayed very heavily over her and she got a big dose of the Holy Spirit or she's wearing a wig. <laughs> I thought it was wearing the wig. So I thought she would be embarrassed. So whilst we all had the eyes closed, I quickly moved her, my hands with her hair around that way, hopefully to get back to the normal. But when we opened her eyes, her hair was down like this. <laughs> so you have to be ready for the surprises. Well, I've been asked to uh, give a teaching on mission. Remember last time I was here, we renewed your marriage vows? Are you still talk talking to your husbands and wives lovingly? Yes. Big smiles. Oh, that's good. Husbands, not so sure. The ladies, yes. <laughs> but the topic for today is mission. So we finish tomorrow, but in a sense we start tomorrow because we go home and we learn, we put into practice all that we, God has taught us over these days. So I was thinking and praying about what I could share with you on mission and I, two things came to mind. The first one is this, in John's Gospel we have the definition of mission. In the first chapter of John he calls his disciples or rather they are attracted to him. And they say to him, they are the disciples of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist points out Jesus and says, There is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. That's what we say in the Mass. And uh, then the two disciples, they drift over towards Jesus. And drift. Jesus says to them, What are you looking for? And they go, Master... In other words, show us the way. And he says to them, come and see. Remember that? Come and see. And on the last chapter of John's Gospel, when the Holy Spirit breathes on them, breathes on them, the, 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 the resurrected Lord says, go and tell the world. Go out to the whole world. So there it is, everybody. That's discipleship and mission. Come and see. Go and tell. The first chapter of John, the second last chapter of John, John chapter 20. Go and tell. 
And that's the life of a missionary, going and tell. I'd like to pick out, rather than give you an abstract talk, because it's hot in this afternoon, it's probably cold for people from India, but for me from, a, from Canberra, Australia, I'm very, very hot. When I go back on Saturday night, it will be about zero degrees. How about that? I hope your son doesn't mind the cold weather. I've appointed him at a place called Goulburn, and that's very cold there, but they're warm-hearted people. <laughs> So rather than talk abstractly, I thought I would talk about mission from the point of view of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I'm going to be looking at particularly Luke's gospel and a little bit of Mark's gospel, but mainly Luke. Luke's gospel is the Marian gospel, the Mary gospel. And I'm going to make eight points. How about that? So to keep yourself awake, you might want to write it down. <laughs> Or if you've got a Bible, I'll tell you what I'm looking at. Do you know everybody that Mary, the mother of God, is the first Christian missionary? The first Christian missionary is Mary. And sometimes we need to ask ourselves, why is that the case? So the first point I want to make is that we look at the Annunciation. We just prayed the Rosary and the Annunciation. This is when the Archangel Gabriel comes to Mary and says to her, will you be the mother of God? There was a film some years ago called Jesus of Nazareth by the famous Italian uh, film director, Franco Severelli, and he had the, the Annunciation scene very beautifully portrayed. I remember it very well. There's Mary, she's having a sleep and she wakes up and the wind, the wind of the spirit, the wind blows open the window shutters and she looks up and she's in kneeling position looking out the window because she feels something strange is happening and a bright light comes in. A very bright light. And we can't hear what the angel's saying but Mary alone hears it. And we hear Mary's answers. She says, how can this be since I am a virgin? And we also hear her say, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let this be done unto me. She says her yes. Mary's, in, a, uh, in the word, the biblical word, for fiat, her yes. So just imagine that. Here comes the first Christian missionary because she is asked to be the carrier, the, the mother of Jesus. Extraordinarily, miraculously, unprecedentedly in her being. You know, some of the fathers of the church say that Mary first conceived in her heart and then conceived in her womb. So she was open straight away in her heart to whatever God would want. We see this in Luke's Gospel. Just think of that. Just imagine they are, you're having a little rest. Uh, the wind blows open your, your window and a light comes in and God asks you to do something extraordinary. You might sort of say, oh, thank you very much, but sorry. Look, you've got the wrong person. The one you want lives next door. I'm a, I, go next door, I'm sure she'll be very happy. To, so Mary didn't say that. Mary didn't say, oh, I'm too young. I'm only 14 or 15 years old. Mary didn't say that. Nor did Mary say, look, look, uh, you've come at a bad time. Uh, I'm very busy at the moment. I have to go and get my hair done. Can you come back tomorrow about the same time and we'll talk about it? I'll even give you a cup of tea and if you stay I'll give you some nice curry, curry fish and rice. <laughs> so Mary didn't say that either. Straight away she said, if God wants this, I'm ready for it. Amen? Amen. 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 If God wants this, I will be the servant, the handmaid of the Lord. And that begins salvation history. 
when the young girl says from the, be the depth of her being, yes, whatever God wants, I want. So that's the first point I want to make about what a Christian missionary is. A Christian missionary is the person who is ready to be directed by God. It's not easy to do. I remember, for instance, um, what, what happened about me becoming a bishop. I was at the time, this is 13 years ago, I was giving some talks to uh, teachers in Darwin. Darwin is the northern city of Australia. These teachers teach Aboriginal children. And uh, I had a, quite a big day, and the day finished about six o'clock in the evening, and I was walking along the esplanade, which is uh, the promenade near the beach at Darwin, and my mobile phone went off. Uh, so I, I picked it up. I didn't recognise the number. I, I fumbled a little bit, and by the time I got it to my ear, the person on the other end of the phone was already speaking. And for some strange reason, the person was speaking in pure Italian. I can understand Italian because I lived there for five years. And I was wondering, oh, this must be one of my Italian priest friends. Uh, but I didn't get which one, and he was talking very fast. And then I was thinking, he's saying silly things. He was saying, I'm ringing on behalf of the Holy Father. He would like you to be a bishop. And uh, he wants to know whether you will accept his invitation to be a bishop. Well, I, I thought it was one of my, you know, it was a Giuseppe or Gino or, uh, um, or one of the other ones, uh, Domenico, having a joke with me. Because they sometimes did that. They would ring up and say, oh, it is the Pope here. I want you to go to another land. You know, they talk like this as a joke. So I was thinking that was a joke. And I, I was saying, oh, yes, I'll do whatever the Holy Father wants. And I was wondering, who is it? And he was talking so fast. And then click, he hung up. So I didn't know who it was. So I, uh, anyway, I got on with it. I slept well that night. And next morning, the phone rings again. And it was my Archbishop, the Archbishop of Melbourne, because I come from Melbourne. And he goes, congratulations, congratulations. I said, why? He said, what do you mean, why? I said, why, why do I need to be congrat?" He said, you're going to become a bishop. The Pope's appointed you a bishop. And I said, and he said, didn't the um, Pope's representative in Australia telephone you last night, the, uh, the nuncio? I said, well, I did get a phone call last night, but I didn't really know who it was. He was speaking fast, and he hung up on me very quickly. Well, that was the Pope's, uh, Pope's representative in Australia. Well done. You've said yes to becoming a bishop. And I said, did I? <laughs> anyway, it was all too late then. It became a public announcement. So, I mean, how about that? So I was thinking, well, I'm sure Mary would have said Yes, straight away, but I'm sure Mary understood what the request was. But her request was extraordinary, to be the mother of Jesus. So that's the first point, to be ready at all times for whatever God brings. The second point I want to make, it's about the visitation. That's right, there it is, Mary in Luke's Gospel. She, uh, chapter 1, Mary sets off. She set out and went with haste to the Judean town in the hill country. This is verse 39 of chapter 1 of Luke. Chapter 1 of Luke, verse 39. Where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth, her cousin. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, just before we talk about the encounter of Elizabeth and Mary, think about that. Put your hand up if you've ever been pregnant. Put your hand up if you've ever been pregnant. There's two men with their hand up. I'll see you afterwards. 
<laughs> they do things differently in India, apparently. When I asked, put your hand up if you've ever been pregnant, no woman put their hand up and two men put their hand up. <laughs> I'll ask the question again. Put your hand up if you've ever been pregnant. Very good. No men have got their hand up now. That's good. They changed their mind. Well, just imagine that. You're pregnant, you're young, there's no real medical facilities in those days, and then you hear that your Elizabeth, who is an elderly woman, unexpectedly has become pregnant, and you feel you want to go and visit her. I'm sure when Mary said to Anna, her mother, I think I should go and visit Elizabeth, Anna would have said, don't do it, you're pregnant. No, no, it's too dangerous. But there's Mary, and the means in which she would have traveled was on a donkey. Can you imagine pregnant women on a donkey? It's not the most comfortable thing, I suppose. And then she went from Nazareth to Ein Karim, which is a suburb of Jerusalem. And I've been from Nazareth to Ain Karim. It, it would, uh, it's a bit like going from here to Kotiam. It's quite a distance. And it's a dangerous road. But there's Mary. Now, the reason why I want to tell you that, there's Mary pregnant with Jesus, and she goes on a trip to her cousin Elizabeth. Let's think about this. Pope, Saint Pope John Paul II meditated about that a lot. And he said beautifully that this pilgrimage of Mary from Nazareth to Jerusalem to visit Elizabeth was the first Christian pilgrimage. And he said that Mary became a walking tabernacle. Beautiful, isn't it? So there's Mary. You know, we've had pilgrimages with the Blessed Sacrament and the priest holds up the monstrance and then we go walking. Mary is the monstrance. Mary is the tabernacle. Inside the monstrance, inside the tabernacle, is the body of Jesus. Corpus Christi. It's the first Corpus Christi procession in salvation here in history. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 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 I want you to think about that. Here's the missionary. She could have said, oh, I'm not going to visit my cousin Elizabeth. I'm pregnant with Jesus. Aren't I great? Aren't I important? I'm going to just sit back here and have chocolates. I'm just going to sit back here and have chapatis. Everybody should be looking after me because aren't I great? God's alive in me. Mary was the opposite to that. Sometimes people go on like that. I'm a Catholic. Everything's good with me. I go to Mass every Sunday. I'm, I say my rosary, but those people over there, they, they're Catholic, but they never go to Mass. And these ones over here, all oh, you know, they're, they're bad people. And in the end, you judge people. Mary never did, did that. She's the missionary. She goes on pilgrimage to the people that need her help. That's the second point about a Christian mis minis uh, uh, missionary. The Christian ministry is all, uh, missionary is always on pilgrimage, always on the move. Let's think about that. I think that's a beautiful image. Mary on pilgrimage. You know, some people even come to church every Sunday and they're so settled in their ways. Can I tell you a little story? I was at a church uh, some years ago. I hadn't been to the church before. I was new bishop to their diocese, to this parish. It was cold. I had a big coat on and a big scarf on. And I liked going to the church before masters to pray. So I went into the church I was the first one in the church and I just sat down towards the back. It was a big church like this and I started to say my prayers. And then all of a sudden there was 
a tapping on my shoulder and I looked up and there was this ferocious looking lady looking at me and she said to me, you can't sit there, that's Dorothy's seat. <laughs> Dorothy's seat, the church is all completely empty. Dorothy sits there every Saturday night for the last 36 years and you're sitting in her seat. She didn't know I was the bishop, you see, because I didn't look, I, I, I had a big coat on. So I didn't want to tell her, listen, I'm the archbishop, would you please sit down and take a big deep breath. <laughs> I thought, now I want to teach this lady a lesson, but I want to do it lovingly. So I said to her, okay, where should I sit? And she just goes like this. <laughs> Over there somewhere. So I was obedient to her. So I stood up and went over to where she waved her magic wand. <laughs> or her broomstick. <laughs> and I sat down there and continued my prayers. And then people started coming in and it was time for me to get ready for Mass as the Bishop. So I thought I'm going to teach this lady a lesson now. So I went into the sacristy and I put on everything I could find that a bishop, I had the cross on, I had my ring, I had the big hat on and I got the big pastoral staff there and out I come and when I came out to the start mass I looked down and there's the lady. She She went down like this. So after Mass, she comes up to me. Oh, I'm very sorry, Archbishop. I didn't know you were the bishop. And I said, well, yes. But uh, even if I wasn't the bishop and even if I was the bishop, do you think that's the nice way to treat people who come into the church for the first time? Oh, she said, but that's Dorothy's seat. I said, I want to tell you as the Archbishop that there are no chairs or seats in the churches that are private real estate. <laughs> we have no private real estate in the churches. Any chair is anybody's. And she said, but uh, Dorothy's been there for 30... But I said, that chair was empty during Mass. Oh, Dorothy must be sick tonight. But I'm just telling you this as a little story. Hand up those who normally sit in the same seat every time you go to church. Come on, be honest. See all the Dorothys around? <laughs> Put your hand down. And they're the honest ones. I'm sure about a hundred of you should have put your hand up. <laughs> We're creatures of habit. We get into our little nest. And we feel, okay, this is my little chair, this is my mass, this is the way things should happen. And you work out a routine for yourself, and you might as well be in the military. You're stuck. We're stuck in our ways. And when God wants to do something unusual, oh, that can't be God. He, he's got to sit in that seat, not that seat. That's, that's my seat. <laughs> but Mary's not like that. Jesus comes in and says, I don't want to just sit in your seat, I want to take over the whole church. And Mary says, if you want it, it's yours, it's your church. And off she goes then in pilgrimage to Elizabeth. So that's the second point. Missionaries are always on the move. They don't live in their comfort zones. They're prepared to be disturbed by God and surprised by God. That's what Pope Francis always says. Be surprised always ready to be surprised by the Holy Spirit who moves you from one place to another. The third point is in the visitation we have there the encounter with Elizabeth and Mary. We would not have the Hail Mary unless Elizabeth was there. The first part of the Hail Mary is what Elizabeth said. Elizabeth comes out to Mary and she says, Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. And then Mary says, 
My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. The Magnificat. There's, there's the first gospel the first gospel example of shared prayer. We all love shared prayer. And there's the first gospel incident of shared prayer between two women pregnant. Was it shared prayer between two women? Yes, but it was shared prayer between four people. Mary and Joseph, Elizabeth and John the Baptist. And John the Baptist participated quite physically in the prayer because in the scriptures in, in Luke it says that the child in Elizabeth's womb leapt for joy when he encountered his cousin in the womb of his auntie. That's the third point. Missionaries are always full of joy. There's nothing worse than a Christian missionary who's sad. I think it was St. Uh, Teresa of Avila said, a saint who is sad is one sad saint. I'm full of the love of the Lord Jesus. Jesus has filled me with overwhelming joy. How happy I am. Well, listen, if you're happy and full of joy in your heart, notify your face about it. You might sort of say, I can't be a missionary, I can't talk like these people. You, the gospel starts on your face. The gospel starts on your face. You smile, but not just a plastic smile. Not just a Mona Lisa smile. She's smiling, but she's not happy. It's called an enigmatic smile. No, the joy within you is radiating out. That's the third point of a missionary. A missionary is always full of joy. Then we move to the birth of Jesus. Joseph is a great missionary. And we don't hear much of him, but he's got all these characteristics. He waits on the Lord. God speaks to him through dreams. He's described in the Gospels as the righteous man, the just man. Just imagine what was happening in his personal life. They had the engagement, him and Mary, and during the engagement he finds out Mary tells him probably, I'm pregnant. <coughs> I suppose the first thing that goes through Joseph's mind is that Mary was unfaithful to him. But no, he's a righteous man. And the Holy Spirit speaks to him in the dream and says, don't be perturbed, accept Mary as your wife. All will be revealed later. And the scripture says he decides to divorce her informally, in other words, to save her any embarrassment. He was putting Mary before himself. He was even putting the gospel before his own culture. His culture didn't tell him. To, his culture would have rebelled against what he did. They would have said, stone Mary, she's been unfaithful to you. She should be stoned to death. Already the gospel of Jesus Christ had embraced him, had come out to him. And like Mary, he acquiesced. It's a lovely word in English. Acquiesced, succumbed to the radiance of Jesus. And there he takes Jesus to Bethlehem. You know, one of the saddest lines, I think, in the whole of the scriptures is the line where it says 
there was no room at the inn. They're looking for some room in the hotel. There was no, there was no hospitality for Jesus. Isn't that sad? I suppose that's the situation with most of the world. There's not a great deal of hospitality at this stage. But Joseph and Mary, they accept the situation, the harsh reality that it is, and they try to make the best of it. You know, some years ago, a grandmother came to me and she said how disappointed she was with her son and daughter-in-law. They had two little babies and she said, Bishop, they haven't baptised the children yet. They're saying silly things. They're saying, well, let the children grow up and they can make their own mind up whether they want to be Catholic or not. I think that's foolish. The parents make the decision on the children's clothing, the food, where they're going to eat and sleep. And then all of a sudden you make this exception and say, oh, the children can make up their own mind about their religion. And that's the most important thing. And she came to me and she said, I'm so disappointed with my son and daughter-in-law and I can't talk to them about it because they get very angry when I bring up the topic. So, Bishop, this is what happened. I said, oh, well, what's going to happen now? I was babysitting for them the other night. The parents had gone out and I was looking after the two little ones. And it came time for their bath. I said, you didn't, did you? I said, you didn't do what I think you're going to tell me. I had to. I baptised them in the bath. I said, you didn't do that, did you? Yes. I said, you, you're only allowed to baptise people if it's an emergency. It is an emergency, she said. I said, it means an emergency like they're about to die. I don't want them to die and not be baptised. I said, hang on. I understand you don't agree with your son and daughter-in-law and I don't agree with them either. But you have to allow the grace of God to work in them over time. I'm telling you this story because many times you're worrying a lot about your children and your children's children. But you've got to leave something up to the Holy Spirit. Uh, many years ago I was on an Aboriginal retreat. Aboriginal people in Australia are the tribal people. They prefer to be out, outside all the time in the forest. They don't like to be indoors. So most of the time we were outside and we built a big... Um, a bonfire we call it, a fire, because it got, gets quite cold in the desert at night. And uh, there we were talking. I was the only non-Aboriginal person there. There were about 30 Aboriginal people. And there, there was an Aboriginal mother with her little baby. And the little baby had hardly had any clothes on. And it was getting cold and the baby was starting to cry. Guess what the mother did? The mother holding the baby, talking to me, she puts her hand out towards the fire until her hand is warmed up. And then she started rubbing her warm hand onto the body of her baby. And she did that as she was talking to me. And as she was doing this, I couldn't, I couldn't concentrate on our conversation because I was mesmerized by what she was doing. And after a while, the baby stopped crying because it was warm. And after about 10 minutes, that baby was sleeping in the arms of mum, who continued to warm her with the blanket of her hand. And I thought, wow, this is beautiful. This is what God does to us. Gently, over a period of time, warms us with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a beautiful image? I want you to keep that image. It's a beautiful image of prayer. And that's what prayer and meditation is, allowing Jesus to warm you 
as you're close by him. And you can cry as much as you like with all your issues and your problems, but you're in safe hands. And Mary is representing Jesus there. Mary is often seen as the, uh, uh, the model or the symbol of the church. Sometimes you see in, from Germany pictures of Mary and she's got a very big blue cloak on the, and it's open like this and you've got hundreds and thousands of people there. Have you seen those pictures? So she becomes the Ark of the Covenant, the new Ark of the Covenant. So I want you to think that is, that's the missionary. Another aspect of missionary is always warming the cold-heartedness of the human heart, always bringing humanity into a situation where there is no dignity. And that was done by that Aboriginal woman without talking to her child. We can talk, 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 talk a lot. But the idea is to listen carefully to what God is saying and a lot of our response is in silence. You know, some years ago, a elderly man was worried about his wife. Did I tell you this already about the deaf? Did I mention this to you the other day? I think I did. Anyway, I'll say it again because I've... Anyway, he was worried that his wife was going deaf. I told you this. Do you want me to say it again? Well, just quickly. And the doctor said, all you have to do is to get behind your wife and just say a few things to see if she hears you. If she can't, you go a bit closer, you go a bit closer, you go a bit closer. So there he went home after speaking to the doctor and the wife was in the kitchen making the meal and he stood at the back there uh, uh, of the, near the door and he said to his wife in a clear voice, darling, what are we having for the meal tonight? And she said nothing. Darling, what are we having for the meal tonight? Nothing. Darling, what are we having for the meal tonight? Right in front, she's right in front. Fourth time. Darling, what are we having for the meal tonight? And she turns around and she says, Oh, sweetheart, for the fourth time, we're having chicken and rice. For the fourth time. Who's got the problem? The man's got the problem. You knew, all the ladies knew this even before I said it. The man's got the problem. The woman's okay. Whereas the men say, she made me do it like Adam and Eve. The woman made me eat the apple. One's blaming the other. <laughs> so there we have Mary uh, very much there, the listening one. A missionary is a great listener of the Lord, and we can learn that from Mary. Do you know there's a lovely passage in Luke's Gospel that tells us about how Mary prayed? We have it. We know how Mary prayed. If you go to Luke's Gospel, there it is there. It's chapter 2 of Luke's Gospel, verse 19. Chapter 2 of Luke's Gospel, verse 19. As for Mary, she treasured these words and pondered upon them in her heart. How did Mary, the mother of God, pray? She treasured and she pondered. She treasured and she pondered. Let's pray like Mary. Mary is the great first Christian missionary and her prayer was pleasing to God. And how did she pray? She treasured and she pondered. Think of those two words. Treasure. When you think next week, you think about what happened this week, you have to pick out some things that happened and you treasure them. That was beautiful. That encounter really lifted me up. You treasure it. It's a piece of gold. It's a diamond. And you ponder. Ponder means it's a bit like having a beautiful piece of food, perhaps a chocolate. You savour it. 
You ponder means you take time to reflect on it. Where was God in that beautiful... Why was that experience so full of joy? What was God saying to me at that time? You treasure and you ponder. That's Mary's prayer. She's a treasurer and she's a ponderer. Think about that. There's the missionary's prayer life. You can't be a missionary without a vibrant prayer life and there's how the vibrant one Mary prayed. And then we also know about her, another point of a missionary, she's the great intercessor. So there they are. They, uh, Jesus is now grown up. Maybe he's about 20, 30, 20 or 30, I don't know. But they're invited to a wedding at Cana. And Cana and Nazareth are not far from each other. I suppose it's only about five kilometres away. You could almost walk it. And there they are. And Mary, it's Mary the one who notices it. The hosts have got themselves into a big problem. They've run out of wine. Now for a culture that prides itself in hospitality, which the people of the Middle East do and they still do, my Lebanese friends, well, if you get an invitation to their house, make sure you've got, had no breakfast or lunch because do they pile it on for the meal? So a big meal is had at the wedding feast, but the wine is run out. They have no wine. Mary knows it. She goes up to Jesus and says, they run out of wine. And he basically says, well, it's none of our business. Woman, why are you worrying me about it? And he, she sort of goes, come on. <laughs> Jesus hasn't worked any miracle. Come on, I know who you are. Come on. But Jesus is sort of saying, look, if I work a miracle now, it will be the beginning of my public ministry. And you know where that's going to lead me to? Death. Mary says, I know that. You've got to start sometime. That's what's going on. That's what the scripture, Catholic scripture scholars say what's going on. It's a rather an obscure passage of the scripture, isn't it? It looks like Jesus is angry with Mary. But Mary is basically pushing him out of the nest. Say on, come on, start flying. You're an eagle. An eagle can't stay in the nest. The eagle's got to fly. What happens if, you, if, if uh, uh, the, uh, the little eag eaglet gets bigger but doesn't want to get out of the nest? It's never going to start its real adult life. You know what they say happens with the little e eagles. In the end, when the, when the parents, the big eagles, the parents think that the child is ready, ready to fly, they kick the child out of the, out of the nest. In other words, they, with their wing, and the, the, things, the little eaglet starts going down like this, and then the eagle comes in and swoops it up. That's in the scriptures. He will raise you up on eagle's wings. That's the idea. So again, three or four times, eagle thrown out of the nest until it starts, rather than flapping, starts to glide. A Christian minister, minister, uh, uh, missionary always glides like an eagle. It knows the winds. In the centre of Australia, Alice Springs is a beautiful town. I was, uh, I've been there many times and I love watching the wedge-tailed eagles, some of the biggest eagles in the world. There's plenty of them there. And when you look at them, especially when they're out um, hunting for food, they glide. They, they know the thermal currents coming off the, off the mountains and they can ride the wind. They don't go like this. A Christian missionary never is a flapper. <laughs> they might do it at the start to get going, but that's it. If you're flapping all the time, it means you're doing it your own way. 
But the Christian min- uh, uh, missionary is the glider, glides on the spirit. Just uh, these eagles that I see, these huge eagles, some of them are as big as me. They just at the end of their um, wing, they just flap or up. Or down. It's like an airplane. I'm, I'm sure the designers of planes have imitated the eagles. They just go down and so just go a bit like. Then they go up like that. Just very, very glide, and they're just gliding. And they seem to be stationary up there. You know, an eagle, an eagle can see a little mouse a kilometer away. An eagle flies the highest and sees the furthest. That's a Christian missionary. Flies the highest, closest to God, and can see like no other one the need. And there's Mary. She's like a giant eagle. And she can see a need. They've run out of wine. This is profoundly embarrassing. My son could do something. But if he does it, he's going to begin his public ministry if, and he'll end up becoming the suffering servant. Isn't that wonderful? I suppose any other mother would say, don't work any miracle. You stay at home as long as you can. I don't want you to suffer, son. I don't want you to have any suffering. So you just stay at home and I'll look after you. No, Mary kicks him out. (laughs) She's sort of kicking him out. Come on, get on with it. Get on with why you came into the earth. Yes, you're my son and always will be. But love always sets free. Love is never possessive. This is very difficult, I think, for parents to set free your children and not interfere all the time. I must say, I I really thank my mother and father. From a very early age, they gave me extra responsibilities. And when I look back on it, they were big responsibilities. When I look back on it, I remember that I have have, uh, one elder brother, one elder sister, and three, three younger sisters. And I remember with my three sisters, I was about 12, I think, 12. And my mum said to the, why don't you take your three younger sisters out for the day? So we did. We got onto the train and we went into the city and we looked around the city and we had lunch and I brought them back. And that was fine, no worries. But when I think about it, I was only 12 and my mother trusted me with the three little ones. She might have said, oh, no, no, no. I've got to go with them. All your older brother and sister go with them. Or dad, dad can go. No, she said, why don't you take that? And she trusted me with her three youngest. I can't believe that. It makes me emotional to think about it. And I never thought about it twice until much later on when my mother died. My mother died about uh, 10 years ago. And you think about the good things that happened and the way she trusted me. I think my mother was very much like Mary, the mother of God. She sort of kicked me out of the house. (laughs) I want to rest today. (laughs) Why don't you take the children? I trust you. You'll know what to do. I mean, to cross the roads are very busy roads. To go on trains, there could be, you know, people with bad intentions there. Handle the money. Make sure the children don't get lost. Other mothers will say, oh, if one of those kids gets lost, you know, but my mother had quite a restful day. She didn't say, how did you go? Did you get the last one? And she said, oh, I hope you had a good day. I said, yes, we had a great day. I don't think she... We didn't have mobile phones in those days. I suppose these days, you know, mothers might be ringing you up every 10 minutes. Everything all right? Everything going okay? Yes, mum, everything's all right. Relax, will you? I'll look after it. Boop. So there's Mary. She frees her son and says, off you go to Calvary. I'll meet you there. And that, the wedding feast of Cana was the beginning of the public ministry. And that was true. After that, Jesus left home. I want to finish up. I've got five minutes to go. I want to um, end up the, the last aspect of the missionary looking at Mary. I go to the Calvary, the moment of Calvary.
I, I studied in Rome in two Vatican universities all up five years. I had a break in between the masters and the doctorate. I went back to Australia and taught for a few years, but all up was five years. And when I was in Rome for five years, ultimately you get lots of people who want from Australia, you don't really know them. People say, oh, when you go to Australia, look up this friend of mine. So all of a sudden, every second week, there'd be people coming to Rome and I'd end up taking them around to show them Rome because I know it like the back of my hand. Um, I didn't mind it every now and again, but not too often because it would distract my studies. But generally the deal was, I'll take you on a walking tour of Rome for four hours as long as you pay for my meal at night. They said, that's a done deal. <laughs> Inevitably, I would take them to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Put your hand up if you've ever been to Rome into St. Peter's Basilica. Have any of you ever been there? A few. Only just a few. Well, it's, it's the biggest church in Christianity. And uh, as you walk in this basilica, on the right-hand side, there's the Pietà. In fact, there's a, over there, there's a picture of uh, the Pietà. See Mary and... and uh, Jesus, that's Mary holding the dead body of Jesus, that's called the Pietà. And Michelangelo, the greatest sculptor of all times, he sculpted the Pietà, which they say is a masterpiece of, of sculpture. He did it when he was only about 23 years of age. They couldn't believe it that he did it. And they said, oh, somebody else must have did it. And in the end, he got in that night and he he chiseled on the ribbon that's across Mary's chest. Michelangelo made this. Michelangelo face it. It means I did it. <laughs> well, I was amazed whenever I would take visitors, most of whom I'd never met before, some of them quite hardened uh, businessmen and women and not necessarily involved with the Catholic faith but uh, want to have a look around. I was amazed how touched the vast majority were when I put them in front of the Pietà. And I said, just look at it for a few minutes in silence. And I'd, I'd go back. And they, it quietened them down. And the raw emotion, believe it or not, coming out of stone. This is the brilliance of Michelangelo. It was like two human beings that had just been caught uh, in, a, in a photograph and it had become uh, marbleized. And even, even on the, the dead body of Jesus you can see veins which are throbbing. So he's dead but is he truly dead? It gives the hint of the resurrection because the veins are all up. He's trying to say it's death but it's not the final thing. There's going to be a resurrection. And there's Mary, her face looks like a young girl of 15, 16, but the rest of her body is a very mature body, a big, big body, large breasts, you know, the idea of feeding and being plentiful. And she sits down and it's like, he's, it's like Jesus is sitting on, on a kingly throne and the throne is his mother Mary. But this is the brilliance, this is why I wanted them to look at it, because there's many aspects to their, not so much as just an architectural thing, but the spirituality there. That Mary is the woman familiar with suffering. And that's the final aspect of the Christian missionary I want to bring to your attention this afternoon. Mary is familiar with human suffering. She holds the dead Jesus as she held Jesus born in the stable. I love to link together the birth of Jesus now with his death. At the birth of Jesus, he was cradled in the arms of Mary, his mother. At the death of Jesus, he was cradled in the arms of his mother. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Mary becomes the great companion of Jesus' life, the first Christian missionary. And then our tradition says that uh, she never died. In fact, in Jerusalem, hand up if you've ever visited Jerusalem. 
Yes, some of you have. In Jerusalem, I've been there four times. In Jerusalem, there's a, a, a church there, Basilica, Mary's Sleeping. It's basically, that's what it means in English, the Sleeping Mary. And, and we say that not so much because Mary was great, but because Jesus was so great in Mary that she assumed, she, she went ahead of us, where she's gone, we'll follow. She anticipates the final resurrection of us all. Her glorious assumption and her coronation in heaven. These are the mysteries of the joyful mysteries of the rosary. This is where still, believe it or not, still some of our Protestant brothers and sisters still can't understand us. Some of them say that we worship Mary. Well, we don't. But we hold Mary in the highest place because Jesus is full in Mary. Every aspect of Mary, even her body, becomes Christified, full of Jesus. Her body... Her spirit, her mind, her emotions, her past, her present, her future. Fully Jesus, the great evangelist, the great missionary, Mary, the tabernacle, the walking monstrance, the one who warms Jesus, the one who consoles Jesus, the one who kicks Jesus out of the, out of the nest, she doesn't say much in the scriptures. If I put together all the things Mary said, there's not many pages, there's not much. But there is no other personality in the New Testament as active as Mary. But it's largely non-verbal. That's the great sign of a missionary. You know, sometimes I can see great missionaries in churches, they're always helping out, but they never draw attention to themselves. I always remember this wonderful man, he died a few years ago, but he never said hardly anything. But he was always the first in the church and the last to leave. He was always the first to put out the, 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 the uh, chairs, the first to put them all back because the church was used during the week in the school, folding them all up, cleaning it. He was there for many hours cleaning the church. He never, ever drew attention to himself. And... Uh, he was always sitting at the back of the church. And I thought, gee, he's a great missionary of this parish. Non-verbal. So let's do what Mary did, everybody. Let's magnify the Lord. Our souls, let us magnify the Lord. Let our spirits rejoice in God our Saviour. For he was mighty. He's done great things in us. Holy is the name of Jesus. And the mercy of Jesus is beyond all telling from this age to ages to come. He puts forth his arm, scatters the proud hearted. He raises the lowly, lifts up the little ones. He has come to our help. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us the great gift of Mary. It was your parting gift on the cross. And when you gave Mary to John, St. John, you said, here is your mother. And you said to Mary, here is your son. And John becomes the symbol of the church. We do not worship your mother, Mary, but we see you in Mary. And believe it or not, Mary now becomes a turning point or a way of coming closer together with our Muslim brothers and sisters. Everybody, just a couple of months ago, I was in Sydney for a very big gathering of Muslims and Catholic Christians. The church was as big as this. And it was the Feast of the Annunciation, which is held holy in Islam and held holy in Christianity. And believe it or not, although there are so much dividing Islam and Christianity today, that which brought us together and still brings us together is Mary. Mary is revered in the Quran. Mary is revered in the Bible. And therefore Mary becomes the missionary of peace today. So her work is not ended. She's still a missionary.
bringing together the different faiths in peace rather than war and violence. So let us conclude our input today by extolling Mary and, telling, and saying to, to all creation that she is to be praised because Jesus is great in her. And we say together, Hail Mary, full of grace. Lord, is with you. Blessed are you, Lord, among you. And blessed is the fruit of our Lord Jesus. Holy Mary. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May Almighty God bless you and keep you. Amen. May he let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen. May he fill you with healing peace. Amen. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. at your face, O Lord. Bless us now in thy love. We the chosen generation, a royal priesthood gathered here. Make us a blessing to all around. Make us a blessing to everyone around us. Make us a blessing to all Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you. We thank you. We adore you, O God. Jesus, you are God with us. Always with us. That's our confidence. You will never leave us. Even when we leave you, you will not leave us. Even when we don't care for you, you continue to care for us. You're God with us. You're Emmanuel. God. Thank you, thank you, worship you, we adore you, O God. We will never fear, we will never fear anything. We have confidence, we have confidence in your love for us, your love that will never be taken away. Your heart is open, always open for us. Your heart will never be closed against us. The veil 
it will never be again in the temple the veil will never again separate us from your presence oh god thank you for tearing open the veil our eyes are open our hearts are open we love to flow into us your heart is open for us god thank you for this great truth for this great truth thank you lord praise you jesus bless you lord jesus thank you lord jesus you were such a great god your love for us nothing can separate us we know how much you love us you were god for us you are our eternal destiny you are our way our truth and our life nothing can separate us from your love for us i love for you thank you lord for being such a great god for being such a great love for showering your mercy into our hearts the one way we want to live the one way we want to make our life on earth a delight is the way of surrender into your hands i commit my life give me the grace of god give me the grace at every moment to turn to you and surrender my life to you lord with you we want to say not only at the end of our life but at every moment in your hands i command my spirit temptation when satan tries to snatch me away from your heart i will i will pray in your hands i commit my spirit whenever there is a challenge and the powers of evil the forces of nature try to frighten me i will pray in your hands i commit my life when my responsibilities overwhelm me they feel so weak and inadequate i will pray in your hands i commit my spirit into your hands i commit again all i am for you Hold my world in the palm of your hands and I am yours forever And Jesus I believe in you Jesus I belong to you reason that i live you're the reason that i sing with all i am jesus 
Jesus, in your hands, I commit my family. Everyone you have given me, my relationships. Lord, I bring them to you. All their struggles, all their troubles, all the pain and challenges that they are facing. Lord, my family, and all the strain I feel again and again in my relationships, my difficulty to understand them, their problem to understand me, everything, O oh Lord, I, I bring to you. I want to belong to you. I want everyone who belongs to me to belong to you, Lord. Jesus, take them in your hands and bless them in your hands. I commit again. To your hand, I commit again with all I am for you, Lord. You hold my world in the palm of your hands, and I am yours forever. And Jesus, I believe in you. In you. Jesus, I belong, belong to you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I sing with all my heart. Jesus, at this moment, I promise to live for you, only for you, to do your will. That will be my food, my joy, my nourishment. To say what do you want me to say, to do what do you want me to do, to go what do you want me to go, love how you want me to love, according to your will. Here I am, your servant, your handmaid, God living for you loving you at every moment believing in your love for me Lord I offer to you now already now the last moment of my life on this earth I do not know when that will be I do not know where that will be I do not know in what shape I will be I do not know who will be there by my side at that moment it's not important it's not important anymore because I know you will be there. It will be a moment of your visitation of salvation. You will be there with your angels to take me into eternal place. Lord, already now, that moment, last moment of my life, I commit. To your hands, I commit to give with all I am for you, Lord. You hold my world in the palm of your hands, and I am yours forever. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I sing with all I am. Jesus, as I surrender. With Mother Mary, with Saint Joseph, with all the saints and martyrs of the church, as I surrender my life to you at this moment, my future to you, my death to you, my eternity to you, as I surrender myself to you, Lord, anoint me with your spirit. I have only one desire to live as you lived, to be filled and led by the Holy Spirit 
as you were filled and led by the holy spirit and that will bring my life to completion to fulfillment to eternal delight lord anoint me with your holy spirit come holy spirit fall afresh on me fill me with your power Satisfy my need Only you can make me whole Give me strength to make me grow Come Holy Spirit Fall afresh on me and all thanksgiving be every moment thine O sacrament most holy O sacrament divine all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine O sacrament most holy O sacrament divine all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine A decision that we should not be destroyed. Calvary, where grace and mercy meet. Calvary, where love does death defeat. Calvary, where Christ became my Savior. Everything to a good 